Healthcare queen, you'll take good care of your hands as we're going to see in this demonstration with Susan. She's going to remove the gel polish, which is a very important process these days, and it should be done carefully. A good nail technician takes care when removing the gel polish, taking care not to over buff and weaken the nails. The first step is the use of an electric drill which gently removes the top layer of the nail polish so that it is possible for the solvent that is going to follow to penetrate and break down this polish called shellac or gel polish. This process of removing the top part, the top coat of the shellac, also known as gel polish, is very gentle and it does not harm the nail plate as opposed to using the buffer, which sometimes can be done in a very harsh way and tends to be harmful and damaging to nails. Cotton wool soaked in solution, which is a solvent that is used to dissolve the gel nail polish, is then wrapped around the nails using foil. This helps it to act quickly to break down what uh, the gel polish is made of and it eases the removal. Susan is doing it very carefully, and gently because she's really a very good nail technician. Once the nails are wrapped in the cotton wool soaked in the solvent called acetone, foil is used and it is given time, let's say around 10 to 15 minutes for it to dissolve effectively without harming the nail. Never use these metal instruments directly before soaking it to try and force out the polish. This is used afterwards once the polish has soaked off and it's done in a safe and gentle manner. Once the polish has been soaked with the solution, the acetone, it is then removed using an orange wood stick. This is actually the most gentle instrument to use as opposed to a metal one. The metal one should only be used very mildly and this ensures that there'll be no trauma or peeling to the nail plate. After gel polish nail removal, the nails are taken care of by gentle buffing and filing to give them a final shape. Once the buffing is completed, the cuticles are treated with a special oil to condition them. The oil penetrates the cuticles, leaving them soft and smooth. They do not look rough and they'll not snag against clothes or anything. The nails are then soaked and washed to prepare them for the application of moisturizer, which will take good care of them before the next gel application. As a final step, the hands and fingers are treated to a luxurious massage with lotion. And then after that, nail oil is applied to the nails to condition and strengthen them before the next gel treatment. And there we have it, a soft, smooth hand, courtesy of Susan, the nail technician. And this is what self-care is all about. Remember, take a break between application of gel polishes so that your nails will have time to recover. This has been Self-Care Tips. Holders are notified to report and surrender unclaimed financial assets to the Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority on or before November 1st, 2021. It is now easier to report and surrender. Visit www.holders.ufaa.go.ke and get started. Beat the November 1st, 2021 deadline. It's your turn. Pass the baton. Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority. Receive. Safeguard. Reunite.
Good evening, welcome to Prime Edition. I am Cynthia Nyamai. Now, at any time now, the president is expected to go live from State House, from actually White House in Washington with Biden. We do have that coverage for you. And also in sports, we are following up a story for you where the Kenya Athletics has decided to defer some of its events in honor of Agnes Tirop, who has found murdered in her home and in business more on tax 101 we will be telling you a little bit more on tax disclosure this is a packed evening so let's begin after the highlights Reprieve at last. Petrol and diesel prices down by five shillings following a month of uproar by Kenyans. Not just yet. High Court stops rollout of Huduma number cards citing data privacy issues. And 10 years in the enemy's territory. Kenya Defense Forces turning around the lives in Somalia. Our sign language interpreter is Lucy Maura. And remember, we'd like to hear from you your feedback. That's KBC Channel 1 on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, the Energy Petroleum Regulatory Authority has revised downward the price of fuel in the latest price review. The prices of super petrol and diesel are down by 5 shillings, while kerosene will be cheaper by 7 shillings and 28 cents. The new prices come at a time when the authority is in the spotlight due to expensive fuel that has pushed up the cost of living. The government has today heeded Kenyans' call to reduce palm prices despite the sharp spike in global crude oil prices. Consumers will from midnight pay less for petrol, diesel and kerosene after the Energy Petroleum Regulatory Authority reviewed downwards the pump prices. A litre of super petrol and diesel drops by 5 shillings, while kerosene will be cheaper by 7 shillings and 28 cents for the next one month. IPRA says the average landed cost for super petrol increased by 1.71%, diesel by 3.10%, while kerosene decreased by 4.110%. The energy regulator says the prices are inclusive of the 8% VAT. In Nairobi, a litre of super petrol will retail at 129 shillings and 72 cents, diesel 110 shillings and 60 cents, while kerosene will retail at 110 shillings and 54 cents. Fuel will be most expensive in Mandera, where a litre of super petrol, diesel and kerosene will be sold at 142 shillings and 75 cents. 123 shillings and 64 cents and 116 shillings and 58 cents respectively. Fuel will be cheapest in Mombasa where a litre of super petrol will retail at 127 shillings and 46 cents, diesel 108 shillings and 36 cents, while kerosene will retail at 101 shillings and 29 cents. Caroline Jenga for Prime Edition. Now to Scales of Justice, where the High Court has declared the rollout of Huduma number cards by the government as illegal. The court nullified the issuance of the cards on grounds that data protection impact assessment was not undertaken. Justice Jaira Sunga noted that the rights to privacy are guaranteed in the Constitution and cannot be short-circuited. According to High Court Judge Jaira Sunga, Section 31 of the Data Protection Act requires data processing to be preceded by a data protection impact assessment for risk mitigation. Katiba Institute had moved to court last year seeking to stop the rollout of the cards 
claiming data could be compromised and the rollout didn't follow the law as stipulated in Section 31 of the Data Protection Act of 2019. While announcing the rollout on November 18, 2019, ICT Cabinet Secretary Joe Musheru said the card would be the primary source of data on citizens and foreigners in the country. For Prime Edition, I'm Ben Troenjue. Now, the government has vowed to use all available machinery to ensure no life is lost due to the biting drought in the north. Defense Cabinet Secretary Eugene Wamala, who was also handing over the devolution docket to Charles Keter, says the government has developed modalities to ensure those affected by the vagaries of weather are assisted. While officially handing over the devolution docket to the incoming Cabinet Secretary Charles Keter, Defense Cabinet Secretary Eugene Wamalwa says the government has mapped out most affected areas and all required assistance will be availed to those in dire need. As the national government is doing the Red Cross, we also are partnering in water tracking. We thank uh, uh, our EU partners. As we speak, through NDMA, they have also released 500 million. This is helping in water tracking and uh, livestock uh, uh, feeds. Wamalwa says currently 23 counties are facing drought and that the government was doing everything possible to address the crisis. Uh, His Excellency the President uh, directed uh, resources to be deployed. And uh, we are very grateful that KDF is already part of the program of uh, water tracking. Devolution Cabinet Secretary Charles Keter and Public Service Cabinet Secretary Margaret Kobia, who were present, vowed to work in unity to ensure that the government's agenda is realized. I promise to continue with that spirit. Let's work together. And I'll be ready to learn within the shortest time possible. So when we combine all our effort in the cabinet, I think Kenyans should be assured that the challenges that uh, most of those, especially arid areas, where I realized over 70% of Kenya and of their land falls under that asylum. Parents have been warned against giving their children unlimited access to electronic gadgets. According to the Ministry of Health, uncontrolled use of gadgets such as tablets, mobile phones and computers by children leads to short-sightedness. Every second Thursday of October, the world commemorates Sight Day to sensitize the public on vision impairment and prevention of avoidable blindness. The Ministry of Health says about 7.5 million people in Kenya have eye diseases and conditions. It is unfortunate that out of this large burden of eye disease, only about 20% are able to access eye care services. An emerging issue in the use of technology with eye specialists warning against excess use of electronic gadgets by children. We know clearly that this has been associated with short-sightedness later on. It has been uh, associated with uh, macular degeneration and also obesity, among other things. Medics are citing challenges in accessing quality eye care services. Migori County, one of the regions with the highest cases of cataract eye condition, offered mass eye screening free of charge. Like if we can look at the all patients visiting outpatient in 2018, 65% of them are diagnosed to uh, have eye uh, conditions. And when you look at 2019, uh, it rose to around 72%. So far, cataract surgery is available in every county as the government commits to improving health care. Kam Chemenza for Prime Edition. Now back to politics where former Prime Minister Raylo Odinga is promising an economic revolution should he ascend to power in 2022. Raila, who was in Lodwa to Kana County, says his top priority, if elected, will be to revive collapsed industries and make Kenya a manufacturing economy to create wealth and employment. He said his policies will center on agriculture production to end perennial drought and make the country.
country food sufficient. On corruption, the opposition leader said his administration will help seal loopholes used to loop public funds. <laughs> Still in politics, Deputy President William Ruto is urging Kenyans to stop ethnic based groupings and embrace political parties with a national outlook. Ruto, who was entitled to veto, said Kenyans should elect leaders with admiral developed track records and who have the country's interest at heart. He said when he supported former Prime Minister Raila Odinga in 2007 and President Uhuru Kenyatta in 2002 and 2003 and 2017 he was a good man wondering why those same people who embraced him when he supported them have ganged up against him Ruto said the hustler movement that was now popular among Kenyans has created panic forcing some leaders to form tribal groupings with the intention of fighting him ahead of 2022 wale waliovunja chama ya jubilee walikuwa wanataka kuturudisha ati kwa vyama ya kikabila na migawanyiko na chuki tukawaambia haturudi kwa vyama ya kikabila kwa sababu mmevunja jubilee tutaanzisha chama ingine ya kuunganisha wa Kenya wote na ndio tumeweka chama ya UDA ya kuunganisha wa Kenya wote na kupanga vile biashara ya kila mtu itaheshimika na vile tutatembea wote kama wa Kenya na wauliza watu wavoi mnataka twende kwa siasa ya kugawanyana kwa makabila ama mnataka siasa ya kuungana Now here's a story that you won't find anywhere else tonight. In 2011, Kenya made a bold move deploying its forces in Somalia after a series of kidnappings in the coastal region, mainly targeting foreign tourists. The mission, dubbed Operation Linda Nchi, was aimed at taking the war to the enemy territory, a tactic employed to ensure that all the Al-Shabaab insurgencies were hit at their base in Ras Kamboni. Ten years down the line, how is it like? Our reporter Halid Abdullahi visited Somalia and brings us this report. Doble, Somalia. We touched down at the KDA forward operating base. It is almost 10 years since the Kenya Defense Force entered Somalia in an operation that was aimed at making Kenya safe by keeping the Al Shabaab terror gang at bay. The situation remains relatively stable, though complex. We joined the Kenya Defense Forces in Sector 2. The troops are headed to Doble Town for their daily patrol. But first, we gear up. The journey to Doble Town begins inside this armored personnel carrier. Locals welcome the armored personnel cars. To them, this is a sigh of relief, a sign of protection, knowing just too well what it means to be a target of a terror group. Ordinarily, this would scare you. The peace or peace of Somali lies with its own people and Somali security forces. Amisom cannot afford to be here forever. At a certain point in time, we have to exit and leave those responsibility to Somali people. The troops make a stop at a local hospital to donate milk dispensers to a local women group. 
In the last year, they have trained some midwives. Currently, they are now they are in the hospital, some are outside uh, the town, other places, under the mentorship. That's the main option that now, even now, we want to train another group of midwives. The journey continues. We have seen expansion and growth of businesses. Afmado, when we ventured here in 2010, 2011, had a population of 1,500 people. Currently, we are talking of a town with over 20,000 people. Since the KDF incursion, businesses have registered robust growth, improving the social economic well being of locals. For the last uh, around 10 years he has been here and uh, everything has been going good uh, since, uh, since the inception of the army Somia and the security has been well. Uh, lorries have been coming to transport uh, things, people have been increased and the business is okay now. Memories paint a picture of a devastated economy, but all this is now history. The KDA forces include gallant women in a special unit technically known as female engagement team involved in securing Doble Somalia. The KDF women troops role is mainly anchored in peace building. The special unit which undertakes patrols and is credited with protecting women and children. They visit villages ensuring all is in order. As the female soldiers under army som 10 we are we are here so that we can be able to reach out to these women with ease because uh, the male cannot be able to reach out to them therefore uh, our main role is just to lead to be the link to these women kdf is now manning sector 2 of somalia which is under loa and middle juba it is beautiful story of restoration and hope 10 years down the line. Indeed, beautiful story of hope and restoration all the way from Somalia. Um, just a comment here from Samson Ayera saying that he's watching all the way in North Carolina. Thank you so much, Carolina. Thank you so much, Samson. And for all your feedback, let us know what stories you would like us to cover for you. You can send in your messages on KBC Channel 1. That's at KBC Channel 1 on Facebook and Twitter. We will be taking a short break, but when we come back, we have all the business stories for you. Kenya <laughs> Katika nchi moja hivi ya East Africa Wa Kenya mtajita wa Kenya mkitutazama hivi wa Tanzania mkaga kuzungumu za matatizo yenu
speaking fluently comes easily for most of us. However, it can be a challenge to some. Stammering is a speech disorder. It means the speech is not in order. When did you discover you had a problem with your speech? At the age of four, mm. because my fellow kids were thinking so. Mm. so Fluent. What needs to be addressed like he's, he's talking about? Giving information to the teachers. Most teachers have no idea mm. that this is a case of stammering. So if they are made aware, they will be handled differently. Rais Uhuru Kenyatta amekuwa katika mstari wa mbele kutekeleza mabaliko kwenye sekta elimu nchini Kenya ili kuwapa watoto wote wa taifa hili nafasi ya kuboresha maisha yao. Wiki hii kwenye project 254 quality education systems cannot be realized without enhanced domestic finance and the focus therefore is on governments to deliver unequivocally on this mandate. We have all the textbooks that are required, textbooks are available, and the textbook is one textbook for one student. Had it not been for free second education, majority of students would not have an opportunity to go through the secondary level. Welcome back. Now we do want to take you all the way to Makueni and find out more about the by-elections. Edward is standing by. Edward Kabasa, can you hear me? Edward Kabasa, if you could just give us Good a evening, highlight Cynthia. of the today's by -election event. The by in this constituency, the Ngu Masumba by-election. Uh, close to five and uh, thereafter the um, vote counting got underway. The turnout is not really that big as at now at least 22 percent of the votes cast um, have been uh, um, according to the turnout, uh, that is 22 um, percent. It had been billed as uh, perhaps one of the um, hotly contested uh, ward uh, by elections, uh, especially in this region. The Wiper Party, which uh, was holding this seat, um, was trying to retain it, and of course, the candidate um, was facing two other candidates one from the United Democratic Alliance, UDA, and the other one, an independent candidate by the name Timothy Meneno and um, according to the board um, there are uh, results which have been streaming in so far 15 out of 34 uh, polling stations have reported and uh, 1470 votes have gone to the independent candidate Timothy uh, Meneno uh, who has been um, receiving some backing uh, from area governor Kivuta Kibwana. The UDA candidate Daniel uh, Kivuva is uh, following uh, him by 852 votes and uh, distant third is uh, the Wiper Party candidate with 484. The results are still trickling in. This is just uh, 15. Uh, this is just 15 uh, polling stations reporting out of uh, 34 polling stations. It is a huge word and uh, we do expect that perhaps in the next two hours or so this exercise shall have been concluded. Just outside there are returning officers who are 
waiting for their turn to report uh, to the tiling center and uh, those results will be announced. Uh, we haven't seen the um, contestants yet, but we have seen um, a number of agents uh, coming in to at least uh, oversee this process. Um, but um, we hope that they're going to be here. We also are expecting uh, Makueni County Governor Kivutha Kibwana, whose uh, candidate is faring on very well, um, is in a very comfortable lead. If at all, the results will keep trickling in. And what we are seeing in terms of the difference, if it is going to maintain um, that particular lead, then perhaps um, his supporters will be comfortable that uh, they will be um, electing a new member of the county assembly. Uh, but this is not just uh, a contest in the world level, uh, it is a contest according to uh, political commentators here. This is uh, a supremacy battle between uh, Governor Kivutha Kibwana um, and Waipa Party leader Kalonzo Musioka as well as Machakos, former Machakos County Senator Johnston Mudama who is the chairperson of the United Democratic Alliance. UDA has been traversing this word, trying to sell its agenda and Waipa Party has also been selling its agenda. The independent candidate who um, for some uh, really strange reason um, uh, w was supposed to miss this exercise and thanks to uh, a, lit um, a litigation in court he was brought back into the fray. In the next couple of hours we will have the exact results. I know that uh, there are uh, those uh, that you have seen on social media but IEBC is mandated to announce the results and that is something that they are already doing and perhaps in the next couple of hours two or three we will have the final result back to you Thank you so much for that. Um, just a report on what is going on in Ngo Masumba in Makueni. Thank you very much, Edward Kabasa, where he says that results are trickling out. 15 out of 34 polling stations have so far reported um, their results. Uh, it is a big area, 34 polling stations. And uh, he says that uh, we expect the final announcement from the IBC later on tonight. We'll definitely be following up that story for you. Now, moving on out on business, at a click of a button, one can verify estate managers' details before renting or purchasing a home. Lands and Physical Planning Chief Administrative Secretary Alex Mu says the registration of estate managers will help streamline the real estate value chain by locking out wayward agents. The government is digitizing land records in all 47 counties to simplify the process of land acquisition and stamp out fraud in the sector. Emerging technologies and shifting demographics are shaking up the real estate industry by influencing all aspects of traditional real estate development and transactions. That is our mandate to register estate agents and also to ensure that their competence is of high standard to be able to protect the public interest. Experts say the real estate agency dependency on technology will continue to evolve even in the future. This will have a major bearing on digital products and services capable of triggering or executing processes on their own. You are an interested party in the process because even if it's your 10,000, your 5,000, your 2,000, you don't want it to get lost through fraudulent activities. Someone posting as an agent to show you a house and they do not have even the mandate to let or to sell that property. To streamline the sector, the Estate Agents Registration Board has rolled out a registration campaign that will, among others, lock out unscrupulous estate managers who continue to swindle Kenyans seeking to purchase, rent or lease property. In fact, even estate agents whom they are supposed to register, 
in future they have to register so that they can also transact with us in the processes of uh, doing their day-to-day -day businesses data collected will be available to the public by the national land information management system enabling them to vet their potential estate managers going forward this information will be available to you and i at the touch of a button i'm regina manyara reporting for prime edition now, the government has put on notice manufacturers that are flooding the Kenyan market with substandard products. Industrialization Secretary Hezekiah Okeo said the government has formed a multi-sectoral team to tackle the counterfeit goods in the country that is threatening Kenyan's manufacturing agenda. According to a study by the Kenya Manufacturing Association, seven out of ten products in Kenya are substandard, causing the Kenyan economy billions of shillings in lost revenue. In the period January to June 2021 alone, the Kenya Revenue Authority seized illicit goods worth more than 4 billion shillings. Within the same period, KRA said it persecuted 74 offenders and destroyed goods worth 13.4 million shillings. Products like such, they would be unscrupulous traders who would want to try their hands by bringing in unfair trading practices. The government is aware, the government has institutions in place, the Kenya Bureau of Standards, the Anti-Counterfeit Authority will be alert. Despite these teething challenges, the government is looking to raise the current manufacturing output through various initiatives. In terms of the way tax administration and tax policies are designed to ensure that they are friendly and that uh, we uh, all the players are consulted. Investors have pointed out to the potential tailwinds in the Kenyan manufacturing market. We have a long-term partner, Rafal, where we've signed a long-term branded business model. We are looking at locally blending so that we have products that are reliably available using Chevron technology and meeting Chevron product requirements from a quality standard standpoint. We will be now also starting the manufacturing as uh, Roshna just uh, informed. Today, oil and petroleum dealer Caltex has launched a manufacturing and blending hub in Kenya to feed the local and the regional markets. Alanaoko, Prime Edition. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, for that story. Now, motorcycles and three-wheeled vehicles are a popular mode of transport in many countries. It is estimated that there are 270 million motorcycles on the road today in Kenya. Discussions around electric motorcycles is fast gaining currency. Our reporter, He Backside, tells us why electric motorcycles are the future of the two-wheeled bikes and why they are likely to dominate Kenyan roads in the future. The process of assembly. Joshua Kamau, an electric engineer at Fika Mobility, is at work making the next electric motorcycle that will grace many Kenyan streets. Kamau takes us through the four stages of an electric motorcycle that will bring to life a zero emission vehicle. At the warehouse, based in the heart of Riru, not a drop of petroleum on the ground. He says the whole machine is run on neatly arranged cables, connecting the motor and the battery to the rest of the motorcycle. Fika, a Swahili word meaning to arrive, is ironically a sign for the pollution-free future Kenya aspires to reach by 2030. The company's CEO and co-founder Rishi Kohli says his passion for sustainable vehicles motivated him to start the company. We wanted to bring a business um, for sustainable transport and we saw the Boda industry as one to penetrate. So we began researching this about two years ago and we looked at electric mobility and electrifying um, Boda Bodas as um, the way forward. So it's commonly used by most of the people. Especially in the Mahali, you know, say, hey, my fika. So we said to use our fika. He says the company's edge is their smart battery technology and an interchangeable battery solution. You know that the fuel cost is going up every day by day. We know that the electric or motorcycles will be much more better in Kenya. The electric motorcycles run for an average of 120 kilometers on a full battery charge depending on various factors. 
A full battery charge takes approximately two units of power, which goes for 40 shillings. Compared to a fossil fuel run motorcycle, e bikes allows riders to save up to 60% on fuel costs. We also have a handful of bikes with uh, direct water consumers. So in total we have about 20 plus bikes with four battery swapping stations. In the next two months we'll be rolling out another 100 to 150 bikes and up to about 20 to 25 swapping stations um, across Nairobi. The motorcycle retails at an average cost of 147,000 Kenyan shillings per unit. So far, the company leases its motorcycles to various logistic and transportation companies, such as Uber and Azara Logistics Limited. The difference between the two being that the electric bikes are very eco-friendly. They don't emit any gases into the atmosphere and uh, there are no fuel costs, uh, a bit of electricity costs, which is not so high. So, Despite that, he is positive that electric bikes will help reduce carbon footprint and make the world cleaner and more greener. As we move forward through the year, we aim to hit between 1,500 to 2,000 uh, motorbikes um, within the next 12 months or 18 months and looking at a scalable plan of having at least 150 to 200 bikes assembled in our location in Ruru um, every month. At first glance, this might seem like a normal motorcycle, but the difference is it runs fully on electricity. In a world where we're trying to be more green and more sustainable, this just might be the future of movement. And for Kenyans, you can finally avoid that petroleum pinch. Reporting for Prime Edition, my name is Hibak Said. Uh, well, the fuel prices necessity is truly the mother of invention. Now, moving on, the East African community celebrated Mwalimu Julius Nyerere Day Thursday with calls to embrace unity and tolerance. This day is dedicated to the founding father of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, a pan-Africanist who championed African socialism and regional integration through the Ujamaa spirit. The late Mwalimu Nyerere was one of the founding members of the East African Federation that bathed the East African community. Betty Ketum tells us more. We should have become united before we became independent, before we became separate states. We should have done that. I did advocate that in 1960. I didn't even go as far as saying, realizing this, I went as far as saying, Tanganyika must delay her independence or ought to delay our independence so that we all become in the, we all become united and then we become we, be, we take our independence Malimo Julius Kabarage Nyerere is remembered and celebrated throughout the African continent and especially in the East African community for his belief in regional integration and the role of economic cooperation for the prosperity of the people. The EAC, a brainchild of Nyerere and other regional economic communities in Africa, are all part of the African Union's overarching plan to form an African economic community by the year 2063. Tanzania's founding father Father believed that most of the EAC economic problems could be solved if people were united. The celebrations held in Tanzania, led by the nation's president Samia Suluhu, saw Nyerere's fundamental principles remembered and lauded as the building blocks of a successful economy. Leo sote Mema yaliyofanywa na baba wa taifa Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere na urithi aliyotuachia. Mwalimu Nyerere alikuwa kiongozi bora asiyependa kuwabagua watu kwa sababu yoyote ile iwe dini, kabila, kipato, maumbile, itikadi au hata utaifa wa mtu. Julius Nyerere offered in 1960 to delay the imminent independence of Tanganyika due in 1961 in order for all the East African territories to achieve independence together as a federation. Although plans for the federation fell through, the groundwork was laid for what was to become the East African community. 
The work of the EAC is guided by its treaty which established the community. It was signed on 30th November 1999 and entered into force on 7th July 2000 following its ratification by the original three partner states, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda. Rwanda and Burundi joined the EAC in 2007, with South Sudan, the latest entrant, becoming a full member in 2016. And today, the EAC is one of the most integrated blocs in the world, where intra-regional trade stands at almost 60% from 400 billion shillings when the Common Market Protocol was launched in 2010 to over 620 billion shillings in 2020. Betty Tum, Prime Edition. The Voluntary Tax Disclosure Program opened early this year, which allows a taxpayer to reveal tax liabilities that were previously undisclosed to the Commissioner for the purpose of being granted relief on penalties and interest of the tax disclosed. As Caroline Jenga further explains in tonight's episode of Tax 101, the program will run for three years and is aimed at enhancing compliance. The purpose of the program is to encourage voluntary disclosure of undeclared taxes and payment of principal taxes by avoiding the imposition of punitive penalties and interest. The disclosure eligible for this program opened early this year till 30th June 2023. A taxpayer who has hidden arrears will be given a 100% waiver on penalties and interest if the disclosure is made during the first year of the program and tax liability paid within the same year. However, one gets a waiver of 50% if the disclosure is made and tax liability paid in the second year of the program and a 25% if it is done in the final year of the program. So far, Kenya Revenue New Authority has netted 2 billion shillings from voluntary tax disclosures within the nine months to September 30th. The relief is however given on penalties and interest, but one is required to pay the principal tax. Where it is not possible to make a one-off payment, a payment plan is agreed upon with the commissioner and the payments are made within one year. A taxpayer cannot be prosecuted for the previous tax liabilities you have disclosed if you are guaranteed relief. However, where one fails to disclose the facts of the tax liability, the commissioner may withdraw the relief and assess additional tax. Caroline Jenga for Prime Edition. Now, Kenya is on the path to becoming the online freelancing capital of the world thanks to digital adoption by youth increasingly taking up digital work. On this episode of Take One, Alan Aoko visited one of the many community-based digital incubation hubs responsible for training a digital workforce on what it takes to become a world leader in digital work from the grassroots. A small army of a busy workforce. From transcribing, article writing, translations, document digitization, among others, this group of youth are just a sample of what Kenya hopes to replicate all over the country as it seeks to create a formidable gig economy. How is this happening? The Ministry of ICT and Youth Affairs uh, in its uh, vision for youth and empowerment uh, for the country realized that the world has shifted uh, long before COVID and so they created a master plan about four years ago on how Kenyan youth could benefit, how Kenya could become a BPO center. According to the 2021 National Study on Digital and Digitally Enabled Work in Kenya, released by the Kenya Private Sector Alliance and commissioned by the Ministry of Information, Communication Technology, reveals that 63% of adult Kenyans nationally are aware of the digital gig economy and that awareness of catalysts like the Ajira Digital Program had increased from 5.5 million people in 2019 to 7.3 million people in 2021. It is expected by 2025 the digital economy in the country would increase uh, the GDP contribution by 9.5%. 9 that is equivalent to Kenya shillings 1.4 trillion. In this digital hub, some digital workers are using skills and to specialize on specific tasks. When you come in in a normal day, you'll find that we have like a, a number of 20 youth in the center. 
uh, five may be training, uh, another five may be main, main mentees who are being mentored. Uh, to make the program as inclusive as, uh, as possible, the curriculum was devised on five skill categories uh, where we said, and the ministry said, look, the, there is work around um, uh, transcription. So that's one skill category. Currently, other opportunity areas as captured by the Ministry of ICT lie in various skills categories that include academic and scientific writing, virtual assistance, online research and surveys, coding and data science activities. Time to sit in and uh, think that there's no work is long gone. I know we have a problem thinking about traditional agriculture, but right now we can talking about digitized agriculture. Experts say Kenya's evolving digital economy has the potential to provide employment vacancies for young people and propel the economy forward and ultimately make Kenya an outsourcing hub by 2030. Digital work in Kenya is becoming more elaborate and refined such that websites like this one of the national broadcaster would be made entirely by the youth of this country, gained from the program that is running here today. Alan Aoko for Tech One. Now to tourism where Kisumu County is betting on ongoing multi-billion shillings infrastructural projects to woo more visitors to the county. The county is banking on the expansion of Kisumu International Airport and the development of the promenade along Lake Victoria to attract over 2 million visitors annually. The county is undergoing an extreme makeover in preparation for the Afri City Summit slated for next next year. The summit is expected to bring thousands of locals and international visitors to the county. Kisumu, which is Kenya's third largest urban center, is a construction zone literally. From the 1.4 billion shillings development of a state-of-the-art conference center to the multi-billion shillings construction of a promenade around the lake, the county is gearing for major transformation. The county has also witnessed major growth in rated hotel rooms, boosting its bed capacity to more than 5,000. The county government says it is targeting 6,000 visitors each day through meeting incentives conferences and exhibitions. We are still saying it is the COVID period, so it's important that people get vaccinated. There will soon be a time when you will not be allowed into hotels unless you show that you're vaccinated, etc. Those things are coming, so please make sure your staff and yourselves are fully vaccinated. Currently, the county attracts slightly more than 3,000 visitors each day, way below the 6,000 mark experience before the onset of the corona pandemic. The county has been badly battered by the COVID-19 restrictions and political tensions in 2017. <laughs> Already the port of Kisumu is undergoing massive refurbishment which is expected to open up transport along the lake corridors. Kenya Airport Authority is also expanding the Kisumu International Airport which has witnessed a surge in the numbers of flight to the aviation hub. I know that I'm doing well because when somebody in the green zone says I want to introduce an extra flight into Kisumu because the demand is so much, I get excited. So now they are four coming in every single day into Kisumu. Then you have Renegade. Then I have Renegade who are saying I need to introduce a midday flight and they've started slowly by introducing weekend midday flights. That shows me there's business coming in and business going on. So we know we're doing all right. A 6,000-seater convention center is currently under construction in preparation of the ninth edition of the Afri City Summit in May 2022. The city center is also undergoing a major facelift that has seen development and refurbishment of new roads, walkways, among other amenities. The city has also witnessed investment in hotels that have boosted bed capacity in the county. Achola Simon, Kisumu County. 
That's all the time we had for business news today. Sports is coming up shortly with Karen Kibet. The vulturine guinea fowl, an animal that has the head of a vulture, the colors of the most brilliant of species, and the tail of a peacock. What I love most about the birds is their behavior, their calls, how the males attract the females. It's very fascinating. We are still studying the reason why anybody in the group can initiate movement and all the rest will follow. This is Wildlife Warriors, and I'm Paula Kohomi. How do you know about my situation? Eh? You've just described it perfectly. What are what bad was perfect? You having a kid or a wife? Why are you poking your nose where it is not supposed to be poking? Hmm? That's enough for himself. Yes, and the number you gave me goes to voice me all the time. You know, I was thinking that maybe you called me. Guys, guys, you cannot leave this class. She's probably coming here. Asisia, get out of my way. You are wasting my time, one. Holders are notified to report and surrender unclaimed financial assets to the Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority on or before November 1st, 2021. It is now easier to report and surrender. Visit www.holders.ufaa.go.ke and get started. Beat the November 1st, 2021 deadline. It's your turn. Pass the baton. Unclaimed Financial Assets Authority. Receive. Safeguard. Reunite. A very good evening to you. I do hope your evening is treating you well. It's now time for us to take a look at what's making headlines in the world of sports. My name is Karen Kibet. Now, Athletics Kenya has postponed all weekend cross-country meets that were scheduled for this weekend and next weekend in Machakos and Eten, respectively. This is in honor of the late Agnes Tirop, who was found murdered at her, o at her home in Elgeo Marquette County. Athletics Kenya President Jackson Tuwei led Athletics Kenya in applauding President Huru Kenyatta's directive to speed up investigations and regulations of the circumstances surrounding the heinous murder of world 10,000 meters bronze medalist Agnes Tirop. For this reason, in accordance with current efforts by the country to improve mental health and well-being, that Athletics Kenya calls for more attention to the sports industry with a view to reaching out and helping sports persons. They need to be sensitized on how to handle life's challenges, how and where to access mental health services. The Federation is preparing a workshop on mental health cases in early December, not only uh, the, the cases, but of course the normal um, seminar in early December, during which Athletes will be invited to candid sessions to identify issues affecting them with a view to formulating solutions to the same. The latest developments in honor of our fallen athletes, we have postponed the first and the second legs of the Athletics Kenya Cross Country Series, which were to be held on October 16th, that is the day after tomorrow, 
and the 23rd in Machakos and Iten respectively. The Federation announced the postponement of the first and second legs of the AK Cross Country, which was slated for 16th and 23rd this month, to an unconfirmed date as the nation condoled with the family of the late. Initial investigations from yesterday indicated that Tirob died as a result of a knife stab on the neck. And may her soul rest in peace. Moving on to matters football, Kenya Premier League champions Task FC have stepped up their training ahead of this Saturday's CAF Champions League clash against Egyptian outfit Zamalek at Nyaya National Stadium. Head coach Robert Matano has said this side is upbeat of an exemplary performance in the clash. Tasca FC qualified for the round of 32 after eliminating Djibouti's at a solar 7 on a 4 1 aggregate score. Zamalek won the CAF Champions League title for the fifth and the last time in 2002, arrived in the country on Tuesday. They are building up a good momentum now. We cannot say today, but it's a good start because we have not been together, all of us. But this week will be okay. And I've seen the way they are working. The, the spirit is there. They are working, they are working well. Everybody is willing to perform. And I think we'll give the good performance. Yeah. Morale is high pretty high the boys the lads are working very well we're working as a team ready for the match you know the task ahead of us and we need to get uh, maximum uh, maximum points from the match the first leg is scheduled to kick off at 4 p.m east african time on saturday at nyayo national stadium meanwhile the return match is set for 22nd of next month at alexandria's bog al arab stadium frederick moki for prime edition Thank you, Moki, for that report. Finally, the United States men's football team claimed a 2-1 victory over Costa Rica while Mexico thrashed El Salvador 2-0 on Wednesday in a CONCACAF qualifying for the 2022 World Cup. Meanwhile, Canada, who are looking to qualify for the World Cup for the first time, also beat Panama 4-1 at home. Qualifying match for the United States. The United States fans in Columbus were stunned when Costa Rica took the lead in just the first minute when Keisha Fuller scored the first goal. Sardino Odes equalized in the 25th minute with a left-footed shot into the top corner and the United States went ahead in the 66th minute with a goal from Tim Weir. Costa Rica have had a chance to regroup but here's Dest! Meanwhile, Mexico who lead the group with 14 points from six matches are three points clear of the United States, while Canada come in third on the group with 10 points. Both Mexico and Canada remain unbeaten in the group as Canada look to qualify for the first time since 1986. Panama sit in fourth position with eight points, followed by Costa Rica on six, Jamaica and El, Jamaica and El Salvador on five points each. Only the top three in the eight-team group qualify automatically for Qatar 2022. And that's your sports. That's all we had for you right here at the KBC Sports uh, desk. Let's do this all over again tomorrow, same time, same place. Do have yourself a lovely evening. My name is Karen Kibet, but the broadcast is not yet over, as I do hand you back to Sin Kenya Mai. Thank you, Karen Kibet, for the spots. Now, remember, we do have the president, our president, Uhuru Kenyatta, in the U.S. in Washington, and we do have a live link that will be coming up shortly. And also, remember, you can continue to send in our comments. We do have, actually, a comment from Sylvia Mweni, who says that she's been watching from the coast and the story on electronic uh, bicycles or motorcycles cycles was interesting she would like more details remember if you want more details on our stories you can check out our website kbc channel one and also more details on our digital pages on facebook and also twitter that's it for tonight we wish you a good night the live link from washington dc with president uhuru kenyatta coming up shortly